Welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the conversation around Catholic sexuality. We're your hosts, Ellen and Kathleen. Before we jump into this week's episode, I want to share with you our in, our prayer intention for this week. Each week of the month of May, when this episode is originally releasing, um, we are praying together as a community for a specific intention that has something to do with natural family planning. So for this third week of May, we are praying for all women. We pray for the conviction of women to recognize the need for better health care, especially when it comes to birth control. We pray that women will get to know themselves and their bodies through fertility awareness. So please join us in bringing this intention to mass with you or saying a rosary or um, spending some time in adoration or some other uh, form of prayer and just bringing this intention and really um, giving it to our Blessed Mother and asking her to untie the knot um, of these various issues um, that we have in our life, especially when it comes to natural family planning and fertility awareness. All right. We are back with another Charting Toward Intimacy episode. I'm Ellen. And I'm Kathleen. And today we are talking about what the heck is NFP. This is an episode we've done a couple of times before. Um, we like to refresh it every once in a while because, you know, things change. We learn new stuff. Um, so this is just a refresh of that a great place to start if you are, you know, brand new to NFP and you have no idea like what this even means. <laughs> yes. If you're a new listener, welcome. This is kind of the basis of this entire podcast. So we'll just answer the question. So what the heck is NFP? Um, the way that this podcast defines natural family planning is two things. It is the use of a fertility awareness based method alongside discernment and prayer. We'll get into yes. both of those a little bit more in just a bit. Um, we're going to, but NFP is not equal to one of those things. It is both of those things together. That's how we define it. Um, so what is an FABM? Yeah. <laughs> um, an FABM, a fertility awareness based method, um, is a method, um, of tracking your fertility, of knowing where you are in your cycle, what hormones are doing, um, whether you are in your, uh, a phase of ovulation or not. Um, and when you're doing this in practicing NFP, um, to avoid pregnancy, a couple would abstain during that fertile window of the cycle. Um, somewhere between um, nine to 15 days is that identifiable fertile window in a typically cycling woman. So um, it all just sort of depends on you um, and, and where you are um, and how your cycles tend to go. Um, but there are various phases to the cycle as well, which I'll pass off to you, Ellen. You can kind of start us off there. Yeah. So um, he, starting with the beginning of a cycle, um, we the cycle begins with menstruation. It's a super obvious sign. Pretty much every woman, whether or not you've been introduced to fertility awareness and the concept of charting, you know how to chart bleeding, right? It's very obvious mm -hmm. the bleeding is going on. You have to, you yeah. know, you have to do something about it, right? Wear a pad, tampon, cup, uh, whatever, disc. <laughs> There's all sorts of things now. Um, yes. So menstruation, um, for some methods, uh, bleeding and menstruation is considered fertile. For other methods, it's not. It's dependent on the method. It's dependent on um, what's being tracked and charted. After menstruation, and it's dependent oh, on your personal cycle as well. Sorry. Oh, so exactly. On your individual cycle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Dependent on, you know, the length of your cycle where ovulation fits in your cycle. Um, so the exactly. first half, essentially, we'll, we'll call it half just for easy sake. The first half of your cycle yeah. is your follicular phase. And the second half ish of your cycle <laughs> is your luteal phase. Um, your follicular phase from woman to woman is different. So some women have longer follicular phases. Some women have shorter follicular phases. What the follicular phase is, is the follicle that houses the egg is maturing and it's getting ready for ovulation. So, you know, you can kind of think about like a mountain, your body gets ready for ovulation. Ovulation happens at the top and then your body, um, kind of goes down from that mountain. Um, the hormone estrogen is what that mountain is. Estrogen rises as your body gets ready for ovulation and then it falls down. Um, and, um, estrogen creates something called cervical mucus. We're going to talk about the biomarkers in just a minute. Um, 
but cervical mucus is one of those biomarkers and it's, it helps you identify yes. that fertile window. Um, at the peak of uh, estrogen, at the peak of cervical mucus, uh, we have the event of ovulation. Um, the egg is viable for about 24 hours um, and then it atrophies. Um, and so we are identifying this fertile window of, you know, the estrogen rising and cervical mucus being present to, you know, through the point of the egg atrophying. If a, if a couple is trying to avoid pregnancy, like Kathleen mentioned at the beginning, they would abstain during that identified fertile window. And then you'd come together during the times when you can identify that um, you as a couple are infertile or well, you as a woman are infertile, but it is couple yes. fertility. <laughs> But the man's always fertile. Right, but men are men are always fertile. Exactly. <laughs> All right, you want to you want to do luteal phase? Yes. So the luteal phase then refers to the well again if we're dividing it to halves, so it's not always perfectly halved. Um, refers to the state of the follicle post ovulation. So what happens is there is a hormone called luteinizing hormone. We call it LH, and what it does is it actually luteinizes that follicle that has now ruptured in the event of ovulation, releasing the egg. Um, it converts it into what is called the corpus, corpus luteum, which, um, now means it means yellow body. So it, that's kind of how it looks on like a, on a scan. Um, and that is the source of, um, another hormone progesterone throughout the remainder of your cycle. Um, so progesterone then rises with the formation of the corpus luteum. Um, which has its own um, really important jobs for the um, maintenance of your cycle um, and for your uterine lining and, and all these awesome things. Um, <clears throat> so progesterone takes over throughout the rest of your luteal phase. Um, and then as it drops, assuming an egg has not been fertilized, right? Um, as progesterone drops, um, all of the hormones of that cycle sort of drop together, um, into like all time lows. And then, um, you begin the next cycle again with your menses. Um, so all those hormones dropping together triggers the next menses. Um, and that is the, that's the very quick picture of what a, what a cycle looks like. And this is like, we just gave you super fast overview. Um, this is yes. something that most NFP instructors, most um, methods really kind of go into this more in depth. Um, if you're like really interested in the science and you're like, I want a method that like teaches me about these hormones, go with them mm -hmm. because that's like really kind of their yes. bread and butter is all about like really giving you that information about you know, what's going you get on. A really, yes. You get a really awesome whole picture view of your entire cycle. And the understanding is just incredible. But I, I, the one thing I did forget to mention, um, that may go without saying, but, um, once you have ovulated, you will not ovulate again. Um, so for that, that entire luteal phase, you are guaranteed infertile. Um, so that is the kind, the biggest part of your phase where it's just like, take advantage and, if you're abstaining um, or I'm sorry, avoiding pregnancy, that's your time, you and your husband. So yes, exactly. Okay. So we mentioned biomarkers. Um, there's three main biomarkers that are used to assess fertility. Um, there's lots of biomarkers. What a biomarker is, is just something that your body like does or produces that just indicates something, right? So um, your, you know, your temperature, your regular temperature is an indicator of like your health status, right? When you have a fever, that's a biomarker telling you that like you have a fever. Um, that's what a biomarker is. So we've got three yes. basic ones that are um, used by uh, different methods. Either one or more of these are going to be used by the main um, methods of fertility awareness. Um, and, and they give you um, some kind of information about that fertile window. So the first one Yes. is cervical mucus. We already mentioned it. It's present um, because of estrogen. And um, mm -hmm. this is something that's observed, like when you go to the bathroom, when you wipe um, or uh, via something called sensation, um, just essentially the sensation at the vulva. These are things that would yes. that your instructor would go through with you on like how to chart and track these. You want to talk about yes. the next one? Yes. The next one is um, what we call BBT, which stands for basal body temperature. Um, 
basal body temperature is um, used in some methods and can be added to other methods um, where you actually take your temperature first thing in the morning, resting temperature, so meaning before you even get out of bed, same time every morning, um, with a very particular thermometer called a basal body thermometer. Um, and you are taking your temperature because what happens is after ovulation, um, with the uh, rise in progesterone, your temperature actually rises as well. And that, that temperature rise sustains itself throughout the remainder of your luteal phase until your next menses when it drops again. Yeah. So it's a really um, good indication of ovulation mm -hmm. happened. Exactly. That it has happened. Um, and yeah, very, very helpful biomarker for confirming your luteal phase. Exactly. Um, pass it back to you again, Ellen. The for, last one. For number three. Yeah, the third one. Um, and again, there's lots of different biomarkers. These are the three main ones that the different methods utilize as primary biomarkers to assess fertility potential. Um, the third one is yes. hormone metabolites in urine. Um, this can be tracked in a couple of different ways. Some methods use something called an LH test strip. Um, that's a luteinizing hormone test, um, also known as an OPK, an ovulation test. You've probably seen those names around the world. Um, it's a super inexpensive test. You buy a big box of 50 of them on Amazon. Yeah. Um, like 15 bucks. Yeah. And you test multiple times throughout the cycle looking for that LH peak. Um, that is what tells you that ovulation is very near. Your LH is going to peak um, for 24 to 36 hours. Um, and that's what tells your body to ovulate is that LH peak. So um, using that ovulation test, that LH test alongside other biomarkers can give you a very good indication of your fertile window. The other way to um, track hormone metabolites in urine is a couple of methods utilize the clear blue fertility monitor, and they utilize very specific protocols that have been studied using that monitor. So it's not just by the monitor, use it the opposite of someone trying to achieve pregnancy. Um, they have very specific protocols that they've you know researched for how to use the monitor and what it tells you um, to in order to avoid pregnancy, um, along with some other information, some different calculations of your past cycle length, um, and potentially using other uh, biomarkers as well. Um, so there's a couple of methods that utilize that. When we get into methods next, we'll talk about which methods uh, utilize the clear blue monitor. But um, yeah, the uh, LH test strips are looking for the LH. The clear blue fertility monitor tracks estrogen and LH. Um, so it gives you a little indication of um, both of those. Yes. All and right. the reason the tracking of estrogen is important is because it determines the opening of your fertile window. Whereas LH determines you're already in your fertile window and you're about to ovulate, the um, rise in estrogen that it detects tells you when your fertile window is essentially opening. All right. Um, Let's really yeah. quickly go through methods. Um, so we have uh, mucus only methods that are only going to use cervical mucus to give you data. They're going to go about it in different ways. Um, but there's Creighton and Billings. Uh, they both use cervical mucus. Um, then there's symptothermal methods. They use cervical mucus plus temperature. Um, the main ones that are out there are SymptoPro and couple to couple league. Um, Symptom hormonal methods uh, utilize. So um, there's a couple different methods or a couple different symptom hormonal methods. Why don't you take symptom hormonal? Yeah. So in the symptom hormonal methods, they um, typically use um, cervical mucus plus some sort of hormone testing. So um, if you just do the little LH like litmus strips that we were talking about that are super cheap on Amazon. Um, FEM uses um, cervical mucus observations and the LH testing. Um, and then there are monitor methods also under symptom hormonal because um, they're still measuring hormones, um, but just not with the little like litmus test. They're using that clear blue monitor, which is a little pricier. The sticks are a little pricier. Um, so Marquette is huge with the monitor. Um, and then Boston Crosscheck is another one that has the option of the monitor. I don't think you always have to use. So the yeah, Boston Crosscheck will actually teach yeah. you all three. Um, we kind we exactly. like to end with yep. Boston Crosscheck because it's sort of like you can you it encompasses yeah it encompasses all, all three biomarkers. It's the only one that like that's its baseline is to teach you all three, um, and then you choose which two you want to track or if you want to track all three. So um, Boston Crosscheck exactly. is kind of unique in that way. Um, some of the other methods do like allow you using more methods or more biomarkers than, um, what's on there. But Boston Crosscheck is the only one that kind of like just automatically teaches you all three. 
Yes. Exactly. All right. So fertility awareness based methods, that phrase is not equal to NFP. Like we talked about at the beginning of the episode, NFP is the use of a fertility awareness based method alongside discernment and prayer. That discernment and prayer portion is extremely important. Um, Fertility awareness and fertility awareness based methods are a tool. They are a decision making tool. Natural family planning is a a lifestyle that really encompasses this constant prayer and discernment. And we have some episodes that really go into that even more. Um, And so we're not going to talk too much about that on this episode because this is really just supposed to be like an intro, get you some of the basics of, you know, what is NFP? Yes, exactly. So Kathleen, is NFP Catholic birth control? NFP is not Catholic birth control, though it can be used. Well, okay, we have a whole episode on this. Yeah, we do. We really do. But to to, to narrow it down, summarize it quickly, like Ellen just said, NFP is a way of life. Prayer and discernment are necessary. They're a requirement to helping you to follow God's will for your family, for your marriage, all that is involved in that. If you are using fertility awareness, you are using a fertility awareness based method to give you a red light and a green light, you know, to know when you're ovulating, um, maybe you use your ovulatory phase, you use a barrier method, um, in the middle of your ovulatory phase, right? Like a condom or a diaphragm, something like that. Um, and you're not praying and discussing your fertility and your family size with your spouse and with, with God. That is essentially not practicing NFP in the definition that we have laid out, right? Which is fertility awareness plus discernment. Well, and Therefore, you've, got, you've got two different things going on there. One, you've got contracepting, <laughs> which is not, exactly yeah. Contracepting is not using NFP. It's also not using it a fertility awareness based method. Um, Even if you are charting and yeah. identifying your ovulatory phase, it is still a contraceptive, right? Yeah. So, fertility awareness based um, method means you know abstaining during that fertile window and then not abstaining, you know, utilizing the infertile period of time. So contraception is absolutely like, that's a whole nother conversation. We've got lots of episodes about contraception. We're not going to go into that right now. Um, but then you've got the other side of it of, um, you know, if you're not constantly praying and discerning and discussing family size, then you're not doing, you know, you're not using the lifestyle of NFP. You're just using the tool of fertility awareness and kind of just living your life. And so again, we've got an episode called selfish NFP that kind of like digs into that. Um, and so really like you know, fertility awareness, it can, it can be kind of used selfishly. It can be sort of like used as Catholic birth control, if you're not really engaging in discernment and prayer um, constantly. Exactly. But if you are, and you are then following where God is calling your family, right, then you cannot be using it as Catholic birth control. Right. Um, you are following Because it's God's just plan, not. Right? <laughs> exactly. It's just, it's literally just not. <laughs> okay. Yes. So we've got, to finish out this episode, we've got some rapid fire questions that we're just going to go through really fast. So um, what about the calendar or rhythm method? Mm. You can use them. They're 100% moral. The thing is not every woman is a robot. And so not every <laughs> woman has the same cycle, right? Not every woman ovulates on day 14 or 15. Um, everybody has a different cycle and therefore you cannot rely, um, on the calendar, the rhythm method, right? As just like, oh, these are the days. That's not how it works for every woman. Um, go ahead and take that gamble if you want to. Perfectly listen, yeah. it, but it's, not necessarily effective. The calendar method basically just counts days and you start um, avoiding pregnancy on a certain day. I don't even know what the days are. I think it's like day seven or something like that. And then, um, you just abstain until you've hit like day 18 or something like that. Um, so it's very, very simple. Um, but it's only about 75% effective. Um, it's again, totally morally illicit, but, um, not, uh, not going to be your best choice if you're trying to avoid pregnancy. All right. Efficacy. Um, so yeah, NFP gets kind of a bad rep because of the calendar rhythm method. It was the like 
calendar rhythm was the og nfp 1930s was when it was mm-hmm. developed it was yeah. groundbreaking science when it was developed um it's not groundbreaking science now it's been almost 100 years since then <laughs> guess what we've made strides <laughs> oh my god in you we know understanding fertility um, but these modern methods of fertility awareness, the ones that we mentioned, they are tracking real time biomarkers. So you're getting real time data about your fertility status. And so, um, perfect use of these method, re- uh, these methods remain at about 98 to 99.9% effective, um, typical use, which takes into considering, you know, it takes into account misunderstandings. It takes into account kind of, um, you know, the actual proclivity of the couple to avoid pregnancy. Um, just the human factor of error, skipping days. Um, so typical use goes into a range of somewhere around like 90 to 99% effective. And again, I'll just repeat this phrase. It's based on the proclivity of the couple to avoid pregnancy. So, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you really want to avoid pregnancy, you're probably going to be charting really diligently and following the rules to a T. Um, if you start loosening the rules, your efficacy is going to go down. It just will. Um, and then all of these stats are based on learning a method from a certified instructor. Um, these are not stats based on reading a book, um, or looking at an online forum or downloading a PDF from the internet. I don't recommend that. Yes. Not, not at all. Not if you really want to avoid pregnancy. All right. So Kathleen, how do Um, I get started? To get started, you first want to pick a method. Um, Ellen has this awesome method match course. Um, and she also has method match coaching, um, that you could use, um, definitely take advantage of her and her uh, wealth of knowledge. Um, if you are wondering where the heck do I get started, um, with even picking a method, because a lot of lifestyle factors do go into what method might be best for you. Um, So you want to pick a method, you want to find an instructor, reach out due to COVID, thanks to COVID, everyone is basically teaching through Zoom these days, um, or at least has the option for that. I've actually never Um, taught in person because of COVID. Like I got certified right before COVID hit and (laughs) I've never taught in person. (laughs) See? Exactly. I've done both, but, um, by the way, if you're new, if you're new to Kathleen and I, we are both instructors. I'm an instructor in a symptothermal method. Femme, uh, uh, sorry, Kathleen is an instructor in femme. I'm in in femme. Exactly. (laughs) Um, so we we both um, do teach. Yes. So find an instructor and reach out, um, and then take the class. That's it. So, you know, and from there, instructors are really good about, um, touching base, um, following up, making sure you're kind of following all the right charting rules and, and understanding. And, um, and they're always there to answer any questions that you have along the way as you start learning, um, and practicing this. Um, so Ellen, when should we get started? Now we know how to get started. When should we get started? Yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) Um, no, basically truly it's, um, this is something that we just really recommend get started as soon as possible. If you are like engaged right now or like soon to be engaged and you're like, yeah, I know I'm going to need this. Get started now because with more practice, you get more comfortable and confident in tracking your own signs. Um, so go pick a method, sign up for a class, um, check out the method match course. I made it super affordable. It's $12. Um, just, you know, to make it really, really easy to just like get all of the basic information and be able to, um, pick a method. All right, Kathleen, do I need an instructor? Do I need an instructor? You need an instructor unless you just want to get pregnant. Um, (laughs) So if you are looking for high efficacy, yes, you need an instructor. Um, you can definitely read a book. There's nothing wrong with that. You can use an app that tries to tell you when you're fertile, um, as long as you're not contracepting during the fertile time and abstaining to avoid pregnancy instead. Um, the problem is that, um, again, women are not robots. Um, our cycles are, um, are, they can be variable, right? Depending on certain life factors that, that happen, stressors, um, diet changes, beginning exercise. Right. So, you know, all of that is to say like, yes, you need an instructor if you're going for efficacy. Um, as we round out this, yeah, as we round out this episode, cause we only got a few minutes left. We got to, um, we want to get through these questions. Okay. So is it hard? Um, 
there's a learning curve with NFP. I think a lot of people are kind of like concerned about, okay, is, is NFP going to be possible for me? Um, there's definitely a learning curve, but that's what your instructor is for. You can, you know, they'll walk you through it. Um, and then on the flip, like the other question of, is it hard, um, abstaining and following God's will for your family, that can get really hard. <laughs> <laughs> the actual yeah. like tracking of the biomarkers, learning the basics, that's honestly pretty easy. Um, after you kind of get through the first couple of cycles, it starts to become very simple. Um, but yeah, abstaining and, um, and communicating with your spouse about those things, that's when it starts getting difficult. Um, and we've got other episodes about that. Um, yes. okay. Um, Hey Ellen, <laughs> Why does it cost me money to learn these methods? So, you know, when I first started learning about NFP, I was like (laughs) so mad about this concept that it cost money. I was just like, you know what? If the church cares about NFP, they should just pay for this. Um, But here's the thing is your instructor is certified. They've spent hundreds of hours in training and practicum um, to be able to treat teach you effectively. They are highly trained professionals. These are not just random people off the street. Um, like any other professional, they deserve to be paid. Um, fertility awareness instructors are historically underpaid for their work, um, and what they offer you. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is when you invest in something, you're much more likely to value it. Um, if you get something like, I mean, it's just human nature. If you get something for free, you don't put a value on it. If you pay a couple hundred dollars for it, you automatically subconsciously put value to it. This is something that you should value. It's actually extremely valuable. You take one class and you know information that you can utilize for like 30 plus years of your fertile life. Um, and like, I personally, I have taught couples for free and I have charged varying amounts and it is fascinating how different the couples like really focus in and apply um, when they've actually paid a significant amount of money for it. Um, but here's the thing. If, if money truly is a burden for you, there are a bunch of organizations out there that offer to subsidize the price. Um, you can check with your parish or diocese to see if they have scholarships available because many of them do, and you just have to ask. Um, and truly if money is actually a burden for you, then you will ask if money is not actually a burden, then you'll find the money somewhere. Um, And the last thing is, look, following God's will isn't supposed to be easy. Um, It's supposed to hurt sometimes. And like, maybe that hurt for you. And this was the case for me. Like, maybe that hurt for you is paying for a class. Um, Mm -hmm. And and that's just what it is, right? Um, So yeah, that's why it costs money. (laughs) (laughs) To make it hurt. (laughs) To to make it hurt. (laughs) All right. And that is NFP in a super quick 26 minute nutshell. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening. If you are not already following us on Instagram, be sure to check us out at charting toward intimacy. And if you listen to podcasts on a platform that gives you the option to rate or review, we'd love for you to do that because it helps us spread the word about the podcast. If you ever have questions, comments, or episode topic ideas, please reach out to us. We love to hear from you. You can reach out on Instagram or send us an email. Our email is in the show notes. Until next time.